And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why I refuse to be positive. That performance from Arsenal has frankly made me unwilling to ever listen to Tommy again. Welcome to the Anglo-Italian pod. As always, I am Rory. And Tommy, do you have anything to say for yourself? Roy, look, you still have a smile on your face, and I was just saying it for your mental health and for your well-being. <laughs> it's better, you know, if then you lose the game, you lose it. But at least you went in it with a smile, right? But did that uh, make any difference? I went in it with cold sweats and came out of it with tears and a lot of tension. Um, but yeah, I will no longer be making any predictions about Arsenal, reluctant or of my own will. Fuck there you go. I do we, not want to talk about him. We can also answer to the first question that we received for today's episode. It's from our friend Reed, who said, why are your predictions so shit? Get at us, Reed. You're going to be here in one week, I think, and you're going to get punched square in the face. But ladies and gentlemen, welcome to yet another episode of the Anglo Italian Pod. As always, you can follow us on Instagram at Anglo Italian Pod, on Twitter at Italian Anglo Pod, and we're sponsored by a page that you should follow. Also, because it's the holiday season, you might want to get a press present for your loved ones and what a web- better website than www.sportsclubmaps.co.uk Rory what are they all about They are all about beautiful products with even beautiful maps of your favorite countries regions and sports clubs that lie there they do mugs posters uh, mouse mats they do everything i think if you want it they'll put a map on it so go over there and check it out some of them all of them are absolutely fantastic except the pencils they don't print maps on pencils because then they they would just be hard to you know to look at not Um, yet those big comedy pencils those big ones you used to get on holiday that'd be perfect you see our friend our friend (laughs) from sports club maps is going to hate us for telling (laughs) that they can get comedy pencils with maps printed on it but guys we're here to actually talk about football there is a lot to discuss champions league groups are over on monday we've got the draw in neon switzerland we can't wait for it but also there is a Europa League that all of a sudden is looking very exciting and then of course we're going to serenade you with our Serie A and Premier League preview. Rory shall we jump on the Euro review blimp? I think it's time to do it. Let's go! It's all come to an end. The Champions League group stage is now officially over and we can wait until Monday waiting to know what the draw is going to be for the round of 16. There have been some incredible last-minute results, but we're going to take it in alphabetical order, starting, of course, from Group A, where top seed after the six games are Manchester City with 12 points, followed up by PSG, who finished second at 11. RB Leipzig make it to the Europa League with seven points, and Club Bruges, unfortunately, have nothing to play for in Europe anymore this season. Not many upsets in the last uh, uh, match day, uh, except maybe RB Leipzig defeating Man City 2-1. Yeah, this was a massively unexpected result and another prediction you'll be surprised to hear, uh, listeners, that I got massively wrong. I turned around and said Man City will comfortably win this game. RB Leipzig have just sacked their manager, Jesse Marsh. And of course, to put more egg on my face, they went out and actually put in a really good performance against Man City. Now, obviously, Man City, as you said, didn't really have much to play for, but they put a pretty full-strength team out. I think they were... They wanted to kind of finish on a high note, keep that momentum going. But the goals from RB Leipzig, particularly the first one, the Schoberschlei, again, love to say that name. The Schoberschlei goal was an unbelievable, beautiful little finish around the keeper and the through ball from the defender was absolutely beautiful. But the main worry for Man City is Kyle Walker and his stupidity. The red card was so needless. Um... And now it means that they'll be without him in the next knockout group and then the first leg of the knockout round. And I just feel like it's something that you don't often see from Man City is like ill discipline, not really. And it kind of surprised me. And I'm I think Pep is going to be pretty friggin' angry about that. But also another surprise is that Unkunku wasn't on the score sheet. Right? I was gonna say, I was gonna say <laughs> it was a surprise when I checked it the other day and I was like, Nkunku, Christoph, what are you doing? Come on, man. You gotta bag at least one per game in the Champions League. But Rory, how big of a threat is PSG at second seed? 
that would worry me if if Arsenal were in it and if they ever, ever finished top of the group, which they never did. PSG being second, I'd be like, that's definitely the team Arsenal get, right? Um, I think that is massively worrying for anyone who finished first and especially as Messi and Mbappe both got two goals and an assist. Um, and it looks like maybe, well, against Club Bruges, admittedly, but there's a bit of a partnership forming there and Messi and Mbappe starting to understand each other is scary for anyone who comes up against them, I think. Club Bruges, au revoir. It's been nice to see you in the Champions League as always. You didn't have quite what it took. But one thing that we need to remind our listeners, they probably know, but it's worth reminding them, this is the first season in the Champions League history when, where away goals are not going to matter mm-hmm. anymore in the knockout stage. Do you think it's going to make a huge difference or not so much? I think it's going to change how managers approach away games massively. I think like when we saw like managers like Mourinho would always go for like a nil-nil at home and then try and catch a one-nil away. I feel like without the benefit of away goals, you can't really do that anymore. You have to try and you can't just settle for a nil-nil at home. If you know what I mean, I think you have to try and win at home and try and kind of win both games. It does take a bit of the, um, it changes the dynamic completely. I like it because I think the away goals rule was so antiquated and so like from a time when it did take days to travel to another country, like sure. that's where it came from. And now we've kind of moved on. There's not a massive, like there's not a massive um, disadvantage apart from like going out to Eastern Europe where it's minus 10 degrees. I don't think there's a massive disadvantage to traveling away anymore. So I think it makes a lot more sense, but we will see managers having to be a bit more um, adventurous and not just sitting back so much. And also since the coronavirus pandemic is everything but over, there are less and less fans at the stadium. There are not Mm -hmm. the full stadiums, so maybe winning away is not as meaningful as it used to be. Just needed to remind our listeners as we move on to Group B, where Liverpool total more than the points of the other three teams combined with six wins, zero draws and zero losses at 18 points. They're, of course, the first seed of the group, followed by... This was intense. Atletico Madrid with seven. Porto are relegated to the Europa League. And AC Milan, as they are putting it, now can solely focus on winning <laughs> Serie A. <laughs> Good luck with that, guys. I was so, I was going to put a meme out of, like, you know, the Game of Thrones winter is coming meme. Yeah. I was going to just put that with, like, AC Milan quotes about being in Europe is actually better quotes are coming. Like, you just knew it was happening. Like, actually, we didn't want the Europa League because now we can definitely win the league. Mm-hmm. Cut to May when they haven't won the league. Um, it's, yeah, I think... Look, we'll talk about the Liverpool-Milan game. Should we start with the Liverpool-Milan game? Then we can go to the main course of Atletico Porto, which was All so right. much fun. As much as I hate to admit it, I've got to I've got to say something about the AC Milan fans. You guys rock. Uh, I've got quite a few friends in the AC Milan curva, and I have to say that these guys, they I mean they're good friends, and they follow them on social media and everything. They are always at away games. They always manage mm-hmm. to create a beautiful atmosphere. And the San Siro the other day kind of knowing what they were getting into because uh, a positive result against this Liverpool team was kind of unexpected by anybody, I think. But they still put up an impressive atmosphere. However, that was not enough for AC Milan to advance. It was kind of one of those games where you kind of always had to look at what was going on in the other field. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if there were screens at the San Siro. Unfortunately, I did not watch the game, but I followed intensely from my sports app. I was very glad when AC Milan made it out. But first, they went up 1-0 with a Tomori goal, his first ever goal in the Champions League. However, then the cards turn, there is a little defensive mistake, and then another one, this time by Tomori. And the Liverpool mm-hmm. capitalize on both occasions and win 2-1, thanks to goals by household names, Mohamed Salah and, of course, Divo Corigi. He's always there on the big stage. What did you make of this game, Rory? Divock Origi again. Um, I was really happy for Tomori to get the goal. I think I was sat there going, man, that guy's been a really good signing for Milan. He's been a great signer. And then he goes and makes a massive mistake for the second goal. But I think actually, as much as he um, did make a mistake for the second goal, I was not impressed by Mike Magnan for either of the goals. I feel Mm. like his goalkeeper for both was pretty dodgy. The first one, he kind of parries it straight to Salah for him to just knock it in. And the second goal, okay, he's put in a bad situation by Tomori, but he kind of 
His arm comes across, doesn't really claim the ball properly. And then it's just like an easy goal for Origi. I think defensively, Milan looked a little bit shaky. But I think Liverpool just looked so composed, like so... They never panic. They never panic. And this was perfectly summed up by Nat Phillips doing a Cruyff turn in his own um, penalty box to clear the ball and play out was just unbelievable. And I felt Liverpool are really... I was talking to Chris, friend of the show, about this Liverpool team. And he said to me, like, I actually think this team are better than the team that won the title. Um, Wow. I think they've, like, developed. There's, like more we were talking about how there's more depth in the squad now and how like the young players like Nico Williams, like Nat Phillips, like Curtis Jones when he's fit are able to come in and just fill in perfectly and that they are kind of getting a bit like they're just getting better. And I think look they are them along with Ajax and Bayern Munich having won every single game of the group stage have to be the favourites, right? But I think Liverpool are the favourites. I think They really do look like a side that can beat anyone. I think Milan, they're still developing. This is their first year back in the Champions League. It was a really rough draw. Like, that is a rough draw. (laughs) And they were in the third pot, right, I think, or fourth pot. So it was like a really rough draw. I think they obviously could have done better, obviously could have done better, and arguably should have done better. Four points is pretty much disappointing yeah it is it is definitely a disappointment it's definitely a disappointment and they would have expected more but i think with that draw you could kind of forgive them a little bit i think as we've seen with milan a little bit when they got in the lead they just weren't able to get another goal they weren't able to see the game out and with liverpool the second they get a sniff you're done and then after once liverpool equalized they kept them at arm's length and it was only ever going one way i was just really disappointed with manyan's goalkeeping but i want to point out about liverpool as well about their squad, um, six members of the LA, of the Liverpool squad that night were from the pre academy, so they joined the club at six or seven years old. So you had Trent, um, Harvey Davis, Nico Williams, Max Waltman, Tyler Morton, and James Norris. They were all, or they've all been at the club since they were six or seven. The one player I want to talk about because I don't think people are talking about him enough is Nico Williams. Now he's a young Welsh player. Uh, defender and he is just absolutely outstanding every time I've seen him play really composed on the ball his passing is like his range of passing is really good and he's a player that I think when he first made his debut he had a bit of a struggle he didn't have a great game and fans were thinking oh god who is this but he's really developed and improved so much I think he's another player that's going to step up for Liverpool and I think we've got a, a question from our Twitter about this very game AC Milan versus Liverpool Rory what have we got the question is, um, is the Italian league, now it's from, is the Italian league so far behind the Premier League and were Milan disappointing? Yes. Um, am I answering the question? Well, yes. I well, think I'll, that, I'll hand it over to you to start with, right? I think that AC Milan were disappointing because uh, they brag so much about their European DNA and then they're very quick in like turning the story around like a nice old egg that you flip in your pan. And uh, now they say that, you know, it was a very difficult group and it's better to focus on the league. So starting from that, I think that only four points, only one win and one draw, and then only zero points in all other games is quite disappointing, especially the fact that they weren't able to do more against the Porto, which are a very respectable team, Mm -hmm. but so are AC Milan. Now, this brings, we're going to cover Inter Milan and how they were unable to win both games or even make one point in both games against Real Madrid. I think that the, and I know you agree with me, Rory, I think that team uh, countries like Italy and Portugal, they have developed a type of football that mostly works in their domestic league, but Mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily hold up in the big stage. Now, Spain could be an exception, but the only teams that are an exception in Spain are Barcelona, Real Madrid, which are like two separate universes compared Mm -hmm. to all the rest, and Atletico Madrid that have a very particular recipe for advancing in Europe, and we'll get to that too. But otherwise, I think we've just got to look at the situation as it is. Our type of football works when the opposition plays your same type of football, and as soon as you find teams like Liverpool, for example, who are used to playing at such high speed, in such open fields, they have those key passes figured out and embedded in them. And they don't even have to think. They kind of play with the automatic pilot. I don't know what you think. 
Yeah, I, th- I think you're right. I think we've talked about it before. Like the first time when I first started watching Serie A in the stadium consistently with you, I would always be shouting at the teams like, run, run. <laughs> when they got the ball, I'd be like, run, why is no one running? Like the football is a lot slower. And I think, yeah, maybe they do struggle to keep up. The only teams that I think, like you've mentioned Spain, I think that's fair. Like the Spanish teams have dominated European competitions for a while now. Like the Europa League and Champions League winners have been Spanish consistently. But the only other league that kind of pushes as well is Germany. And I think their style of football is kind of the most similar to English football in terms of its pace, its physicality. True. Um, but the question from at Mon Sportif LDN was, is there a gulf between English Premier League and the rest of Europe? Do you think there's a clear gap between between those, just the Premier League and then everything else below it? Now, look, uh, we covered a beautiful Bernardo Silva finish for Manchester City a few weeks back. Do you remember that volley, Mm -hmm. that beautiful volley? I think that that type of play, you only see it in the Premier League, starting from the back, big time open space up front. And there is like, when I showed it to my Italian friends, they all commented on the same thing. Like, where are the defenders? Like, why is there (laughs) such an open field? This is this goes back to one thing that before I started following English football, a very knowledgeable friend of mine told me. He said, in England, teams play to win the games. There are no such thing as we're going there and try to keep a draw. They mm. play, it's like it's like a boxing match. It goes back and forth, back right. and forth, back and forth. The pace, I think the pace is key. And maybe these bigger Italian clubs should start focusing on a recipe that doesn't solely work on their domestic league, but also works on the European stage. I think there is a big gap in the style of football, but also in the money that is invested in the sport, in the academy system and all that. I read a very interesting article about Chelsea. All like the, I think more than 50% of their current squad is an academy product. Mm-hmm. And that also helps create a very solid team. These guys have been playing with each other for 10 or more years, and that definitely helps. You were saying the same thing about Liverpool. These kids that nobody had ever heard of, they go to the San Siro, one of the most intense grounds in mm-hmm. world football, and they they you know they, they are surrounded by champions. They don't want to go down in history as the, the side that wasn't able to win that one game in the group stage. There is the motivation, and then the fact that they know each other by heart. I mean, there, there is a lot. We could have a, a, a single episode only on this difference between the Premier League and all the rest of Europe. But good yeah. question, friend. No, exactly. No, I think you're absolutely right. I just find that, like, and I'm going to kind of go the opposite way. I think there is a massive gulf, like, financially, and you're right, with the academies and how, like, young players get chances a lot more in the UK, I feel. But what i often find the the narrative around this and i'm not accusing uh, our friends who asked us the question of this but the narrative often around it is that it's like a, a very arrogant it's a, the premier league is good therefore every other team every other league is rubbish and that seems to be the view and i'm forever defending these leagues when i'm at home and being like no the city is great to watch bundesliga has some fantastic teams like league 1 is great to watch like hey, serie a huge interve- entertainment value this year it's the oh, league with the most goals, goals yeah goals per game it's absolute insanity at the moment like and it was last year as well but i feel like the view from england is often quite arrogant and it does wind me up and uh, so on talk sport this week jason cundy and jamie o'hara who are both <laughs> pundits in name only i don't know what either of them i achieved as much as them in the game i think it's probably fair to say they were spouting off about how the premier league's leaving the rest of europe behind these leagues are terrible the champions league is just dominated by english teams it's like okay yeah chelsea won it last year but dominated by english teams i think is a bit of a leap so i find that the narrative just gets a, it, it comes from a place of arrogance so i, I it does sit un- uncomfortably with me but you know i'm like that anyway <laughs> i don't know but let's move on because in Group B, we had the two games in one as Atletico took on a Porto away from home in Portugal. There was a football match, but within the football match, there was a wrestling match. And oh my, did I love it. Dude, if I play, like, I, you know, guys, that both Roy and I have a soft spot for Atletico Madrid, but at the same time, those guys can be absolute pricks. And they feel like they kind of, they, they're kind of, man, they, they live basically with Cholo Simeone. I feel like they're trained to sense when a team is about to lose it and there's just like leverage on that and just like be like oh yeah you want to fight let's fucking fight but the thing is that in the other team there was a certain mr pepe uh formerly known for kicking players with his uh football cleats <laughs> on the pitch <laughs> and uh, 
I loved how you know there was this, this they started fighting and there was a red card for Atletico Madrid. One minute later, there is a red card for Porto. And I love how in this situation you need your captain to calm people down. And Pepe just goes with the gorilla shout to Hermoso's face and he's just like, fuck off. It's like, man, dude, you're the captain. He got a yellow card and then protested, of course. And the referee looked at him and it was just like, dude. You know it better than anybody. <laughs> Shut the fuck up right now. It was beautiful to see. Beautiful to see. But the first time, Pepe was like the peacekeeper. For the first fight, Pepe was like trying to calm people down. He's like, oh, oh, oh. No, no, he's separating people. Like, wait, 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 wait. Wait, is Pepe trying to extinguish some fire? What the hell's going on? What Five world minutes are we later. living in? <laughs> Five what? minutes later, he, gra- he grabs the, the gas tank and just like empties on the fire. But <laughs> talking about the actual football, this was a pretty, pretty intense game because Atletico Madrid were drawing, I mean, they were winning only 1-0 with a very fine margin. Mm-hmm. And then three goals happened from the 90th minute mark. Ace, uh, Atletico Madrid sealed the win with a co- very convincing away 3-1 result. But my question is, Rory, is this a threat for the for the top seeds of the group, these Atletico Madrid? Because they weren't as impressive as they usually are. Well, I was looking at Sid Lowe's Twitter feed and he said that he, he kind of put this um, these facts up that blew my mind. So, Atletico only led for for 37 minutes across all the group stage games, right? They only led for three minutes in the first five games. Now, this, this tells you that they've not been playing as well as they should be. This squad is arguably one of the best Atletico squads. Like, the talent in this squad is ridiculous, and they've not been playing as well as they should be. But... It also tells you that they find a way to win. And again, it's another team that if you were matched, like, Tommy, if you got Atletico, are you feeling confident? No, I'm not. Definitely not feeling confident. Like, you could be in the greatest form and they could have not won in three years. You face Atletico and you're thinking, they're going to do us here. They are going to mm-hmm. do us. Like, mm-hmm. they, you just, they find a way to do it. And you, you pointed out at the beginning, they do. They wind people up. They wind the teams up, wind the players up, wind the players up, and push it to a point where either you break or they break, and hopefully you break before they do. Like, they do just wind people up, wind people up. And you know that if you've got hot-headed players, like if you've got Vidal playing against Atletico, he's going to last five minutes, right? <laughs> like, they know exactly what they're doing, but it works. It works. And you know what? I really enjoy watching it. When I was in Madrid, I used to go and watch them and they were fantastic. And I really, really enjoy how shit housey they are. Like they're just incredible. Big time. But let's move on to group C. We're going to review this quickly because there are still a lot of groups to go and there are no Italian nor English teams in this one. Mm. I'll just call it the Ajax group and the Sebastian Aller group. 10 goals in his first six Champions League games ever. This guy deserves a round of applause and this Ajax team is absolutely unbelievable. They've won all six games just like Liverpool, conceded only five goals, scored 20, half of which by Sebastian Haller, who had an XG of 7.72 across the six games, which just tells you about something that the guy understands his position and where to shoot from. Second, in second position, we've got the Sporting at nine points. There were no upsets in the last match day because we knew already mathematically that Borussia Dortmund were going to stay out of this. Um, Dortmund, however, do win very convincingly 5 0 against Besiktas. And the only thing I want to say about this game is that Haaland gets his first uh, substitution in after a while. And in a matter of 10 minutes, he scores a brace, a header, header, of course again, he does. just like that effortlessly he was pissed off by the Haller thing Haller overtaking his own record right exactly he now has 23 goals in 19 Champions League games just when you're kind of getting carried away with Haller you're like oh yeah just remember Haaland's record right (laughs) but I also I wanted to talk about very quickly about Ajax and the Eder Divizier now if because Ajax have gone through top they could get a favorable draw in the next round right Mm -hmm. um which could see them through to the quarterfinal now if they go through to the quarterfinal and PSG go through PSV sorry go through the group stage in the Europa League which looks pretty likely there's AZ Alkmaar there's Vitesse Arnhem and Feyenoord all doing well in the conference league Eredivisie could overtake Ligue 1 in the coefficient and get more places for Europe if the European teams do well 
based on how the French teams have done in Europe. So this could be huge for Dutch football. And it also shows you the quality of the league, like the quality is increasing in that league. Um, and yes, Ajax do tend to win it, but there's a lot more competitiveness competitiveness there with Feyenoord and PSV. And it's a league, again, that I would definitely recommend watching. And it is getting better. So I think Ajax are leading the way and they're showing that there's great young players, great coaching, more importantly, Ten Hag, please God come to Arsenal. Like <laughs> there is a lot of talent in that league. And yeah, League One is under threat. Yes, it's been under threat for a while. <laughs> but also uh talking about domestic leagues, a very unimpressive nation football wise has been Turkey. Um <laughs> Besiktas. I don't recall seeing Many teams with zero points after six games, they managed to score three in six games and they conceded 19. Guys, come back next year, maybe a little bit more prepared. Let's move on to Group D. Group D, where Real Madrid qualify as first of the group with 15 points, Inter second with 10. FC Sheriff, kind of a revelation. Oh. They, they, they finish above Shakhtar Donetsk and go to the Europa League. And Shakhtar Donetsk, only two points over six games. The Dzerbi recipe maybe was too... There was too much hype around it because mm. nobody was impressed with Shakhtar. Actually, one of the worst teams in yeah. this Champions League group stage. But let's start from the Real Madrid Inter game. I would have loved to see a win. Uh, my you three... got the score, right? Just the wrong way around. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, he said with the... Inter will win with a two-goal deficit. Now, all right. The unfortunate thing is that both goals were unstoppable. Um, mm -hmm. There could have been better defending on Kroos. Yes, I admit, a defender should have left their spot there and just go, like, block him. This guy... Although, although sorry, Handanovic did just do the classic of watching it go in. No, no, no. That he, was the he, second he dived. one. That was the second. Well, man, but oh, the okay. second one. Okay, so the first one, he dived, and he actually almost touched it, but it was unsavable. And the Asensio goal... I challenge yeah, 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 yeah. any goalkeeper in the world mm -hmm. to think that that shot is going to go where it's going to go. It's so confusing. It looks like a cross, but at the same time, you think it's going to go out, and it happens so quickly. Now, the biggest thing that we need to talk about this game is a massive loss for Inter Milan because Nicolo Barella gets a dummy, dummy, dummy red card, and he will potentially miss both round of 16 <sighs> games because according to the UEFA rules mm -hmm. this was reiteration and he punched the player however it didn't really get him on the shin but there is a possibility of a two day uh, match sorry a two match ban sorry I couldn't mm -hmm. put my yeah it's because it's violent it's because it's violent conduct right but Militao that was an absolute Dick's trick of attack of a tackle. I've seen that so many times. Hitting a player when they're in midair is so dangerous. You don't know where they're going to go or how they're going to land. It was you can't. It was incredibly stupid from Barella. Incredibly stupid. And I saw someone on Twitter saying it kind of reminded him of his of his days back at Cagliari, and he thought he'd kind of grown out of this. But you have to say Militao was well out of order there and should have arguably got more than a yellow. Yeah, um, our friend Adam from the Hopeless Wanderer podcast, this is one of the questions that came through our Instagram at Anglo Italian Pod. He said, how is it possible that the VAR did not uh, mm -hmm. uh, review also Militao's foul? Look, you know, Adam, that when it comes to refereeing decisions, we're pretty ignorant around here. I do think that Militao was a bad foul. The guy, Barella is running and Militao is not even looking at the ball and he just shoulders him. That's super dangerous, a very sad. Plus, it was mid-air as he was running. And you're going to end against the, you know, the advertising. Yeah, the, the holdings. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's that's that kind of hurt, right? Mm -hmm. Luckily, Barella didn't fall so badly. But then that reiteration. You're right, man. It's like when he was at Cagliari, such a class player with a list of yellow cards that you could easily do without. The first year he was at Inter Milan. I remember players, his teammates, would shield him whenever he wanted to talk to the referee because they were just like, dude, you need to learn. You're not at Cagliari anymore. <laughs> a yellow for you, like, means something yeah. for the rest of the team. I have to say, though, that I don't think Militaos was a red and he still got a yellow. He did. Mm -hmm. He was booked for that foul. Okay. And Barella's, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a red card. You don't do that. You don't fall down and then try to punch whoever fouled you. That was mm -hmm. kind of stupid. And again, though, going back to what I was saying about Simone Inzaghi, 
when he was asked about this foul, he did not say anything about Militao. He was just like, this is a very bad loss. But I left the pitch. He excused himself with the entire team. He knows he's done a big mistake. Hopefully, this is the last time this happens, which is what I want to hear from a coach. I don't care if Militao's was a foul or not. He got booked for that. But what matters is that your player, one of your key players in your midfield, did something very stupid that could potentially damage the entire team come mm-hmm. the round of 16. Um, about Bayer, about Real Madrid, it really feels like they're starting to hit form under Ancelotti. They're first in the in the Liga with uh, quite with quite some comfort, and mm-hmm. uh, they play when they are on their day. They play some spectacular football, and Kroos, Modric, Casemiro, they're all still there, and they're all still doing what they've been doing for the past for the better part of the past 10 years. Well, this is it. And we've had a question from what if football at what if underscore YouTube saying, are Real Madrid inevitable both in Spain and Europe? What do you think, Tommy? And then I'll throw in my two cents. Mm, I think Real Madrid are Real Madrid. Look, uh, uh, Tony Kroos's was the 1,000th Real Madrid goal in the competition. They averaged 2.2 goals in the Champions League since the beginning of the competition, which is so impressive. When you talk about the European DNA, the only team that you can think about is Real Madrid. I mean, mm-hmm. this is Real Madrid's competition, and they're not going to back down, and they are the most dangerous team, in my opinion, at any draw in the Champions League because this team is there for one reason and it's to win games. Recently, they've gone, they've undergone a sort of revolution ever since Ronaldo left. They haven't always been the Real Madrid that we've been used to seeing year in, year out. But look, I think they still have a very impressive squad. Vinicius Jr., I think he's on his way to becoming like a household name in European football. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know, they're, they're a good team. They're a very, very good team. Yeah, they're they're incredible. And I think people aren't really... It's weird. You know when they did the three Champions Leagues in a row? Mm -hmm. It felt like they weren't really getting the the kudos they deserved, right? People were hyping up the Barcelona team that were the greatest team that that was ever assembled, right? But for a team to retain the Champions League three or to win it three times out of four years is an unbelievable achievement, right? And I feel like, again, this team is kind of getting ignored for the amount of talent that's there. Like, you you do still have that incredible midfield. You've got Vinicius in incredible form. You've got Asensio, who's really hitting form, and then Benzema, of course. I feel like people aren't talking about them enough, almost. Now, I was reading about them. They have... They are overperforming their XG more than any team in Europe, right? So... Bear with me. Of all European European top five leagues, right? Um, in it's XG, so boring, right? Rory. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. Okay, I'm joking. Start again. Start again. So in all of Europe's top five leagues, they've ranked the teams with the highest XG, right? Okay. Real Madrid are 14th in that table, right? What? Considering considering they're top of La Liga, that's kind of surprising, right? So mm-hmm. they're 14th, but they are outperforming their XG by 9.3. Mm -hmm. Right, So they've scored nine more goals than you would expect them to score, right? Now, eventually, you would expect this to kind of reach the mean and maybe they will start kind of hitting that average. Um, But the thing is, with Vinicius Jr. and and Benzema, they've got two strikers that are just in incredible form and the way they're playing is really suiting it. So they have Benzema kind of dropping deeper so Asensio and Vinicius Jr. can kind of both cut in on the wings And what they can do is either take a shot at the far post, which all their strikers, funnily Mm. enough, have a real talent for hitting the far bottom post, right? They can either take a shot at the far bottom post or they have Benzema running in. And we know how good he is at finding space, running into the box. They can, Or they can cut it back to him for him to tap in, right? But this means that the chances that they make are within the penalty, an area that produces low XG, right? Because you're expected, or high XG, because you're expected to score, right? But they also have strikers that are absolutely on fire. So their whole system is set up for them to outperform their XG almost with the players and how they're playing. So it's really interesting. It'll, it's whether they can keep outperforming this their their average or like what maths dictates and the problem for real is that defensively they do have problems Mm -hmm. so if they do start coming back to the mean 
then their defensive problems will start to be more of a problem. But with the form that Vinicius Jr. and Benzema are in, I'm sure they'll be fine. I just thought it was really interesting that they're like massively outperforming it. And Tommy, the team that are second in outperforming their XG are in Serie A. Can you tell me which team it is? They are outperforming their XG. That's uh, in no, Inter Milan? No. No. Not at all. No, wait. Outperforming. I'm lost now. That they're okay. They're getting so Real Madrid are outperforming it the most at 9.3. Yeah, this yeah. This team yeah. are outperforming it the second most on 9.1. Mm, I don't know. I think it's gonna be a team like Verona or something. Nailed Verona? it. Hellas there Verona. Hellas yeah, Verona, yeah. 9.1. They they are scoring a lot of goals. <laughs> they are scoring a lot of goals. Look, yeah. two, two things about XG. Number one, I don't think Carlo Ancelotti is even aware that this statistic exists, but that man mm. knows football very yeah. fucking well. Another <laughs> thing about Ancelotti, man, there is something... Look, this man, every time he had the possibility, he would spout shit on Inter Milan. And usually I write those names in my death note. But Carletto Ancelotti, I have a soft spot for him. And when I look, when I see him on television, it's just like a flashback to my childhood. Like mm-hmm. seeing Ancelotti with that eyebrow. You know that, that reel that was becoming viral on Instagram? Like that smile. That yeah, damned that smile. Damn smile. And for yeah. me, it's that eyebrow, that damned eyebrow that sometimes goes up and you're like, oh my God, it's going to go mm-hmm. higher. It's going to go higher. <laughs> it's going to leave his face, you know? And another thing about XG, I told you that my dad doesn't follow football that much. So I had an idea. The last time I visited him, I was just like, dad, you're passionate about mathematics. I've got something that you're going to be interested in. And I was like, the XG stat. So I pulled up this article. I read him everything about it. And my dad was just like so unimpressed. And he was like... <laughs> That's bullshit. I was just like, all right, fine. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's why I said bear with me because I realized as uh, the second I mentioned XG, a lot of people just went, oh, for fuck's sake. No, I, <laughs> think, I think it's a great stat. My dad was just like, dude, look, I don't know. When I was a kid, the football was about like, you know, scoring goals. G's. Yeah. G's <laughs> yeah. And now it's about XG's, but whatever. But let's move on to group E, where, yes, Bayern Munich make no fucking prisoners. And they kind of prompt our weekly topic for this week because we're going to talk about the most disappointing performances in the Champions League group stage ever. It's not so much Bayern Munich that prompted us, but Barcelona. Fuck you, Blaugrana. How's the Europa League feeling? I am so happy about this. I think it was a long time coming. We kind of all... And I mean, me and Rory wanted to see Barcelona in the Europa League. In the both, mud. Get them in the mud. You know, the, the Arsenal history with Barcelona, the Inter history with Barcelona, they, we just want them to see, we just want to see them fail for a little bit, you know? Just uh, a little the, bit. There, there the was a lot of, days, a lot, the, sorry, there was a lot of Arsenal fans who don't have a lot to celebrate at the moment. And they were all celebrating about Barcelona going out last night. I've never seen so many pictures of that red card to Van Persie before in my life. The timeline was just full of it with people like yes take it <laughs> Bayern Munich win 3-0 in the last game of the group stage beautiful goal by Leroy Sané who then proceeds to miss like four or five sitters he scored the most difficult of the XGs but all the other ones he just failed miserably there is one where the right back I don't remember who it was just looks at him like dude for real like he just <laughs> missed that and you scored the other one right before and Barcelona, I, they were kind of nowhere to be found. And the, the Lewandowski assist to Müller for the first goal, you're just like, where is the defense, boys? Like, what are you doing? Like, Lewandowski has the time to try to drive ball past the Piquet, then kind of steps back with the ball under his, his shoe. And then he just, like, rip, pulls it back, little chip assist to Müller, and it's, he just has to tap it in the goal. It was it was levels, absolute levels, and I think Xavi came out after the game and said we cannot compete with Barcelona at the, uh, with Bayern at the moment. We are just not the same level, and they're not. The squad looked it's so average, and I think I tweeted last night. Oh, I think Arsenal could actually beat this Barcelona side. Like, can we get them now, please? I feel like we could actually beat them. But uh, another stat that I saw online, and um, the last time that Barcelona failed to qualify from the group stage. All of Eric Garcia and Sufati and Pedri had not been born yet. That is how long ago it it is since by uh, by uh, since Barca didn't get through the group stage, and it is great to see. 
you know, when I hear these stats, I just want to bring it in. And probably the Twin Towers will steer standing, right? They were still up. Quite possibly. I'd have to check right. the year. Yeah. Beautiful. But uh, in this group, Benfica, uh, despite not knowing the result at Munich, they still managed to uh, overcome Dinamo Kiev 2-1. And they advance to the round of 16. Of, 16, of six teams, no, of 16. Um, these are good Benfica side. And mm-hmm. they think that if the draw is in their favor with maybe a lucky top seed, they could advance even further. Well, they were playing some beautiful football. The football for the first goal was genuinely like there was back heels, little intricate passes, triangles. It was beautiful to watch. But if you want to talk about bad misses, there was a miss from... Is a go here, if I want to say the name is that was absolutely <laughs> awful. That would have made it one nil. Of course, he misses that, and Benfica go straight up the other end and go one nil up. And then it was contest over at that point, really. It was Benfica looked like a good side, but they are not happy with their manager, uh, Jorge Jesus. They want him gone, they are not happy with him. You guys, learn this saying goal sbagliato, goal subito. It means you miss a goal, you get scored against yeah. right away. <laughs> Now, Rory, let's tiptoe around this group because we know that this podcast is known for jinxing things. Now, the only game left in the Champions League, and I have to say something about that, is the game between Atalanta and Villarreal. As we're recording, we're at the 20th minute mark and Atalanta are down 1-0. No, no Tommy, it's worse. No. It's worse. It's worse? It's 2-0? It's 45th plus 2 and they're 2-0 down. Oh my God, this is not looking good for Atalanta, but we know that this team can overturn things rather quickly. I just have to say one thing about this uh, about this, uh, this game. UEFA, fuck off. Because mm-hmm. that game should have not been postponed. Yes, it was knowing big time, but you can still wait for one hour. All the players are there. All the fans are there. What happened is that they waited for 20 minutes, it didn't stop raining, and 30 minutes later, there were pictures coming from the stadium with the snow already melting. There are people who have jobs that buy tickets to go to the stadium to watch their club. It changes all the experience, both for the teams that are competing in the competition, but especially for the fans. So let's stop saying football is for the fans if you cannot wait 30 minutes, in which also, I mean, whatever. I just thought it was stupid and I wanted to address it. What was? How did you feel about that decision? Yeah, ridiculous. And then they put the kickoff time for half past six, right? Um and which is an awful time for people who are finishing work, people to get to the stadium. Like, so you've bought your ticket, then you rearrange it for a time that's completely unattainable for people who have jobs. And it's like the lack of thought behind it. And all, sorry, it was at seven o'clock. And it's all because they didn't want it to be in the way of the Europa League. Like, of course. Look, the people who are going to watch this game are going to watch this game. The people who are going to watch the Europa League are going to watch the Europa League. Like, it, it wouldn't have made a difference and all you're doing is punishing the fans and it is just like classic UEFA. Like, yeah, they could have waited a bit. The snow was pretty intense, but they could have waited a bit and they could have rearranged it at a time that wasn't a complete pain in the ass for fans to get to. Like, if you've got a job at any office, you're going to be struggling to get to a ground for seven o'clock, right? By the way, what the fuck is Unai Emery doing? Does he really want to advance in the Champions League? Does he know that if he gets knocked out at the round of 16, they're not going to go to the Europa League? Somebody give him a phone call so Atalanta can overturn the score. But in this group, Manchester United are top, regardless of what happens in Bergamo tonight. But they drew 1-1 against Young Mm -hmm. Boys. What do you have to say about that, Rory? Well, it was Ralph Ranjit kind of openly said, this is a chance for me to see the players that I haven't seen yet. So it was very much like a B team. Um, Apart from like Rashford and Greenwood, there was like a kind of players that you maybe wouldn't expect. Um, Greenwood's got a really beautiful kind of overhead kick slash scissor kick goal, which was uh, to open the scoring. That was a really, really nice goal. Um, But the moment of the night that everyone was talking about was of course... Robbie Savage being commentator during the game as his son, Charlie Savage, came on to make his Man United debut and his debut in the Champions League. Look, I have my own feelings about Robbie Savage and how much he annoys me. But I think no matter what your opinion is of the man, um, that was a really heartwarming moment. It was really beautiful to hear his kind of his voice wobbling a bit and the pride that he had in his son. It's a huge moment. And I think it kind of showed that Ranić is... Um, 
he's willing to give everybody a chance, right? He wants to look, he wants to see exactly what he's got, who can do what he wants them to do. And his comments after the game about Greenwood were really interesting. He said, sometimes he doesn't look athletic um, and we need to work on his mentality. But if he does these things, he will be a great player. And I think this is something for United fans to be quite excited about. Like Ranić will develop players. If he's there long-term and it's increasingly looking like he will be, he will develop players and he will have a system. I think it's something genuinely to be very excited about. Also, I think it's very interesting that Matic was backgraded to the defense, the furthest mm -hmm. away from the opposition <laughs> goal. You just stay here and you just, you're a big <laughs> dude. You just stay here as a center back. But yeah, I think it's great. And this kind of tells you something about the ideas that this man has. And what better stage to bring on the youngsters, if not an important European stage that is going to responsabilize them. Okay, does it exist? Make them no, I don't think so. But it's fine. No. I think I know what Responsabilizzare you mean. in Italian. Yes. Uh, it exists. <laughs> that is going to make them uh, you know, feel proud of being mm -hmm. there and also perform. And in the end, a 1-1 one -one draw with all these youngsters is not that bad. They could have done better, but it's not that bad. And um, we have to quickly say the first ever English Asian player made his debut for Manchester United in Iqbal. Huge moment. We've talked to a long time ago, friends of the pod, the Outsiders Footy, who are um, Asian English themselves. And they talk about the lack of representation within the league, the lack of representation in players anyway, and people getting into the game. And it's great to see this happen. A big step forward and something that we're seeing at a few clubs now. So, yeah, another nice moment within the game last night. Two groups left. I'm getting worried because I think that for the first time we've done like a solid review without jumping back to the groups that we've already covered. So I'm tense right now. Are we gonna? Don't start jinx it. You just jinxed it. You just. I just oh, did I forget it. to mention but... in Group A? Uh... No, 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 no. It's over. It's over. But Group G. Oh my God. Group G. This was the only group where everything was to be decided at the last match day. What does it read right now? Lil. Top seed with 11 points, followed by Salzburg at 10 points. Sevilla go to the Europa League. And Wolfsburg, Auf Wiedersehen, Auf Wiedersehen. Rory, did you watch any of these games? I didn't catch any. I just watched the highlights. I got absolutely humiliated on my Wolfsburg shout, right? They got battered. Oh. <laughs> absolutely battered. Yeah, I watched, uh, for the first time in a while, I watched the BT Sports Euro goal show. It was unbelievable. So I kind of managed to see all the highlights. Wolfsburg were absolutely terrible. Defensively, they were all over the place. Lille were more than happy to take advantage. Salzburg played a, their first goal, was really beautiful play. And then they just kind of saw the game out. But a huge moment for Salzburg, like the first Austrian team to get into the Champions League knockouts. Absolutely massive. And I think for again, a quite like a in English, in English, we say a banana skin. Like a team that, if you take it lightly, they could definitely do you. Like they've got Adiemi, they've got Okafor, they've got obviously this is the club where Haaland came from and Schaubuschlei and all these exciting players. So you know they've got young, talented players that if you don't take them seriously, they will make you pay. And it was actually quite an entertaining game, the Salzburg Sevilla game. And for Sevilla, they're in the Europa League. They'll be fine. They're going to win it. <laughs> they're perfectly happy with that. Once uh, once we'll be done with the group stage review, Rory's got a question for me. Which are the groups, which are the teams that you hope mm -hmm. Inter will draw? I have a list, but of course, my top seed is in group, it's the top seed of Group G, Lille, <laughs> simply because I have friends there, not because they're 11th in League on and uh, they are the, the weakest of the top teams in the Champions League this year. Not because of that, just because I have friends in Lille, of course. But they do have Burak Gilmaz and Renato Sanchez, so you need to be careful. Need to oh, be careful. We've, we've got Barella. Oh, no, we don't. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to Group H, where Juventus, oh, lucky fucking bastards. Lucky bastards. <laughs> Look, lucky bastards, but at the same time, there is one last team to worry for Inter Milan. I would have not liked to draw Chelsea. So good mm. that Chelsea finished second. But lucky bastards, they were about to go <laughs> to finish a second. And then an incredible goal from Zenit St. Petersburg to draw the game 3-3. It was a beautiful volley from Oddoev. Man, pick that out. Hey, Kepa had a touch on it. And Rory, I'm fully on board with your opinion that ever since Mandy came... To, to the Premier League, Kepa got better because he, despite the three goals, he had a few good saves and mm -hmm. the guy 
it, it feels like he's on it. It's no Karius that after the mistakes, like God knows yeah, what yeah, happened yeah. to him. He banged a few hot models and now he's nowhere to be found. But <laughs> it feels like Kepa is actually there to stay and uh, there to improve. So good, good job, Kepa. What, but what did you think of the game, Rory? Um, a, a bit of madness, a bit of madness. But I also, I'm going to go against you now and say a better goalkeeper stops that. I think he could have got more to it. Mm. I think it was a good goal, but I feel like he could have got a bit more on it. Um, but the standout thing now is that Chelsea's defense has been there, like their rock. And now in the last two games, they've conceded six goals <laughs> and you're like, wow. Okay. Maybe they are properly wobbling. Like they are properly Eight wobbling. Goals at the conceded in the last four two per game. Like, it's a lot. It's a lot. And I think, look, they knew they were through, so there's going to be a certain level of, like, um, complacency. But for them to lose top spot is really, that could be huge. Lukaku got a goal. Werner got a goal. So they're all, like, um, bright two spot. goals, dude. But, sorry, two goals. Sorry, Timo. I, sorry to take that away from you. Um, so they're all bright spots. But I feel like Chelsea are on a bit of a wobble and Tuchel is sounding a little bit nervous. But Juve, tell me, how do Juve always do it? How? I don't know, fucking Juventus. Um, the, today, <laughs> this is not related to the Champions League, but I just read this quote from whatever his position is at Juventus. This guy, I've Portobello, I think. Portobello. Okay, yeah. Um, I don't know. He's like, I don't know, some sort of bitchy face who works Executive. at Juventus. And he yeah. said, about the investigation going on at Juventus, we are listed on the stock market. We need some respect from the media. And it's just like, dude, the big problem is that you are listed on the stock market and you were cheating and you were making your shareholders like bet money on you when you were lying about your profits. So that's exactly the problem. But look, I don't know how fucking Juventus do it. They won one nil against Malmo. The first goal in the Champions League with the Juventus short for uh, uh, Moise Keane. Mm -hmm. He's the second youngest player, uh, the second youngest Italian player to score in the Champions League after Alex Del Piero, ladies Ooh. and gentlemen. Yeah. I like that. And they finish a uh, top spot. Lucky bastards. Chelsea are second at 13 points. Zenit are third in the Europa League. And Malmo finish with only one point. And I don't know how to say goodbye in... Uh, Swedish, right? Yeah, in Swedish. Yeah, I have no idea. No, Mama. Dirk, that's just going to upset loads of Swedish whoa, people. Whoa, <laughs> that's just gonna... <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. In 2021, Rory, you do sorry. things. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Wow. That that was something. We're going to get an email from the Swedish media. It's like, guys, what are you doing? Don't wait on our country. <laughs> but that's it. We're not going to talk about Atalanta anymore. You guys will know the result by tomorrow. I'm at Ladea. But, dude, this means that... The Europa League is going to look pretty lively because we've got the West Ham's, we've got the Barcelona's, who else have we got? The RB Leipzig, Porto, Dortmund. It's going to be an Man. interesting league. And the Sheriff, don't forget. And maybe, no, I'm not going to talk about Group F. Sevilla are in there too. Zenit, it's going to be exciting. But Rory, ask me the question. I, I just gonna quickly say, and the thing we're most excited about, we want to see West Ham Barcelona. The draw has to give us West Ham Barcelona. We have to see it. We have to see it. Possibly so, in the Tommy, final, but we will accept it at any other round as well. Yes, yeah, final preferably. That would be incredible. Um, so, Tommy, the question is, of the teams that have qualified, rank them in order of preference of who you want and who you don't want. So, the teams that Inter could draw are Manchester City, Liverpool, Bayern Munich... I'm sweating already. Ajax, <laughs> Manchester United, and Lille. Now, of course, it's difficult to make this list without sounding disrespectful to any of these teams. But of course, if I could, if I could make a draw happen, it would be Lille. Look, mm -hmm. this team—they're they, no mugs. Last year, they were—they—they—they they, they won the league in France. It was huge. They, they've got some very experienced players. They've got a good combination of youngsters and and veterans. This year, however, they've been a little bit disappointing, but they're strange because they're 11th in league on, but they haven't lost a game across all competitions in eight. Their last defeat came against PSG, so they're a tough team. They could, they can hold on to a draw, and this year, I remind our listeners, there are no away goal rules. So if this team brings you to a stall at their home and then you have to go to the penalty shootouts against them at their home, it could get intense. However, they're my first take because among the other teams that we could draw, they're definitely the most favorable draw. Mm -hmm. Number two, 
Ajax or United? I say Oof. United. I say United. I say United because I think that they are a team that are undergoing a change. There is a new manager. There are a lot of things that are not quite working. Um, it needs to be fixed. We know that the round of 16 starts in February, so maybe come February they will be, I don't know, completely renewed and they will be one of the best teams in Europe. I can't know that. I know that Ralph Ragnick is a man whose pragmatism kind of scares me and intimidates me. He just looks like, you know, kind of like the, the very smart, but kind of evil, very smart, but also a little bit evil scientist in like the, the, the big American blockbusters. Yeah, he could be in like an end of world thriller. Like yeah, where he's yeah, kind of yeah, designed yeah. the he's designed the genome that's going to take down the world. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You got it right, right on. And uh, so I think, yeah, Manchester United, despite their home field being Old Trafford and their the star of their team being Cristiano Ronaldo, I think that this is the team I the team I would take over Ajax because Ajax they're little tricky bastards now. They've won all the games in the group stage. They've mm -hmm. played some beautiful football. Sebastian Allaire looks incredible. I want to see them in the round of 16. I think they will be intimidating even come February. But I think that Inter would have could, could have a bit of a chance. These were the top three. Now let's get to the bottom three, the teams that I really don't want to draw. But I have a feeling that it's going to be one of them. In order of preference, Manchester City, I prefer it to Liverpool, which I prefer to Bayern Munich. <laughs> now, let's start from Manchester City. Well, let's start from Bayern Munich. Do I need to explain why I don't want to draw Not against really. Bayern Munich? <laughs> Not really. Very yeah. good. Then we move on. Liverpool, as Rory likes to call it, it's death by a thousand cuts. Historically, in recent years, our draws against Liverpool have not been good times in Milan. So, I don't know. It just feels like a very complete team. They they are hitting form right now more than ever. And uh, they can win at the San Siro with a second string uh, side, pretty much. And they're just intimidating all over. Mohamed Salah mm -hmm. is not going to stop. Um, the Maybe, look, maybe, I don't know when the first game of the round of 16 will be, but there could be some players still missing for mm -hmm. the Africa Cup of Nations for Liverpool. We shall see of between among Bayern, Liverpool, and City, the team that looks the least intimidating, but still very, very intimidating, don't get me wrong, is Manchester City. Mm -hmm. I think that out of the three, it's the only it's the only one where we could snatch draw here or there. I don't know. Does it make sense? Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely fair. I was surprised United are like your second favorites, but yeah, I'll take that. I think that's fair. Would you take Ajax over United? No, but then you say that, and I'm like, no, not really. Yeah, you <laughs> see, I think you they're see, better coached. I think they're better coached, right? Look, as much as I, I don't watch that much Eredivisie, but I'll just say one thing about Ajax. Either they're going to crumble right away in the round of 16, or we are going to see this team advance until the final stages mm -hmm. of the competition. Anything more to say in the Champions League, Mr. Ruri Crisquolo? I think that's it. I think we've done all of the groups in alphabetical order. We've done it without jumping around the place. We can give ourselves a pat on the back. I'm doing it right now. Nice. Nice there little pat on the back. Room. Nice little <laughs> pat on the back. It's now time to preview this weekend's fixtures across Serie A and the Premier League. But remember that we're not quite done because right after this, we've got our weekly topic special and then our brand new Passaparola quiz where Rory Criscuolo is going to be tested with as many questions as there are letters in the alphabet. We can't figure out how many exactly they are, but it's going to be an exciting one. Shall we start from Serie A, Rory? Let's do it. Serie A, we start off tomorrow night, actually tonight for you listeners. It's Friday and we've got the Derby della Lanternina. Ooh. It's the Genova Derby and they read a very good joke, which I didn't get at first, but it was a picture of Ferrero, now former president of Sampdoria, because he's arrested and he's in jail, that said, I'm waiting for all you fans at Marassi on Friday night. I didn't get it at first. Then I did a little research online and I discovered that Marassi, besides being the Genova Stadium, it's also 
the penitentiary that's that's <laughs> right by the stadium. <laughs> so they, they did a little pun there. Genoa, Sampdoria, good news for Shevchenko, if we can call them so. But there is only one of the many players that are out injured, one that should be featuring in the starting lineup, which is Domenico Crescito. Also good news for my fantasy football deeds. Um, it's kind of funny. He's the penalty taker for Genoa. They've been awarded five penalties already this season, but since he's been injured, no penalties. So I expect him to come back either with a red card or with a penalty scored. It's going to be an interesting game. Both teams are kind of struggling. Genoa definitely struggling. Shevchenko still looking for his first win at the Rosso Blues home. We shall see how it goes. On Saturday, December 11th at 3 p.m., we've got Fiorentina Salernitana. At 6 p.m., Venezia Juventus. And I think that I'm not going to do any predictions this time around. But I think this one is going to be an interesting game. I'll do a prediction. Both teams are going to score at least a goal. We saw that Venezia can score. They scored three after the first half against Verona. Then Verona came back and won 4-3. But it's two teams that I, I feel like if Juventus are caught on the counter, it could be dangerous. And that night, we've got Udinese Milan. AC Milan now have only the league to focus on after the home defeat to Liverpool. I think that if they slip right away, it's going to be very, very funny. Udinese haven't gotten a win in a long time, specifically since November 7th against Sassuolo. Since then, three draws and two losses. They can score goals, but they can't hold on to a result whatsoever. And then we move on to Sunday when we've got Torino Bologna at 12:30. Then we've got at 3 p.m. Elas Verona Atalanta, which I'm very excited about. I think it's going to be a goal fest, a very, very tactical game, too. Then Napoli taking on Empoli at home after slipping last week against Atalanta and drawing previously to Sassuolo. They desperately need to bounce back and get a very important win if they still want to stay in the Scudetto race. Then we've got Sassuolo Lazio at 6 p.m. Hmm. I think it's going to be goals. We've already talked about Lazio conceding far too many goals, um, but some players have been hitting form. It's going to be an interesting one. And on Sunday night at 8.45, we've got Inter Milan Cagliari. Cagliari still only with one win in Serie A. I don't understand how this is possible with the squad that they've got. We've covered it in depth already, but hey, Please don't get that first win at the San Siro when we are playing you. It all wraps up on Monday night with Roma Spezia at 8.45. Can the Giallorossi finally get a good result against a much weaker side? They haven't won in two because they lost both to Bologna away and to Inter Milan at home. Over to you, Mr. Chris Qualo from the beautiful Albion Peninsula. And, <clears throat> sorry, uh, in the Premier League, it all starts on Friday night at 9 o'clock. We've got Brentford versus Watford in a relegation battle. I don't know. Watford are currently in 17th on 13 points. Brentford in 13th on 17 points. Bit of a switch there. Um, so, if Watford managed to get a result, it could drag Brentford bang in trouble. But I think this could be quite an entertaining game. We've talked about before Watford play quite well, just never quite well enough. And Brentford kind of seem to be the same. They play nice football. They pick up points here and there. So it'll be interesting to, say which, w- w- interesting to see which way this game goes. Then on Saturday at half past one, we have Manchester City, who are now, of course, top of the table. Somehow they've just found themselves top of the table. Five wins in the last five, taking on surprise package and a team that nobody's talking about this year. Wolverhampton Wanderers. Wolves are in eighth on 21 points, only two points behind Arsenal now. Um, And I feel like this could be, look, we talked about it before, Man City are hitting that efficiency mode. But we saw Wolves push Liverpool all the way last uh, in the last round of fixtures, took Origi, that last gasp goal to get the win. So can Wolves um, frustrate City to an equal level. You have to also say that is a t- that's a difficult run of fixtures for Wolves, Liverpool, then City. Okay, good. Then on Saturday, first of the three o'clock kickoffs, we have a kind of weird derby, which is Chelsea versus Leeds United. Chelsea in this wobble, defensively all over the place. Leeds starting to turn things round. 
big fans of a late goal. Could we see a surprise at Stamford Bridge? I'm going to say there might be one there. Then, the game that everyone is going to be talking about this weekend, again on Saturday at 3 o'clock, Stevie G makes his big return to Anfield as his Aston Villa team rock up at Anfield. This could be, again, another interesting game. Aston Villa back in form, defensively solid. Liverpool looking terrifying. Can Stevie G pile some misery on the Reds? Or is he just going to roll over and let him win because he actually wants him to win the league? It's going to be interesting to see. I think there's going to be a lot of fight in this game. I feel like it's going to be a, a yeah, an aggressive game. Then we've got, oh God, Arsenal taking on Southampton at home at 3 o'clock. <laughs> we want to say cannot... a few words about the previous Ar- Arsenal game that we opened with. Right, you know why? Right, the Everton defeat, the Everton, Everton defeat. Yeah, I know. You've been wanting to talk about how shite Everton are recently, Uh, so I want to know what happened. And when you said, "Why don't you be positive?" You, you're ten games unbeaten. Be positive. And I was like, "Because I know the underlying numbers. It's a lie. It's all a lie. We've been scraping games by one goal and just." picking up these wins and you're like this can't last forever this can't last forever a team that never never creates chances can't score we can't score then our strikers stop scoring oba's been fucking useless lacazette is useless we've just got nothing up front zero goal threat it genuinely is worrying for me anyway so we take on southampton at three o'clock a team that historically we really struggle against so i cannot wait for that one um then the late game The late game on Saturday, we have Norwich City taking on Man United. Now, Man United are about to start a very, very comfortable run of fixtures. This is the first one. Manchester United are probably going to win. That's all that needs to be said there, really. Then on Sunday at 2 o'clock, we have Burnley taking on West Ham, the Battle of the Claret and Blues. Um, West Ham, fresh off beating Chelsea. Could they go within three points of Chelsea? Um it will be interesting to see. Burnley, I thought they'd be all right. And now they're starting to be dragged back into that fight again. They are 18th on one of the three teams on 10 points. So running out of time to pick up points. I think West Ham could get a win here. Um, then at the same time, two o'clock on Sunday, we have Leicester City taking on Newcastle. Newcastle bang in form after their first win of the season. Leicester City all over the place. I think Newcastle could actually fancy getting something here. Yeah? Um Leicester cannot defend, but neither can Newcastle. So maybe plenty of goals in this game. Um, Again, same time on Sunday at two o'clock, we have Brighton taking on Spurs. Now in the pattern, it says this is going to be a draw. So bang all your money on draw, listeners. But I think this game is postponed because of a few coronavirus cases at Tottenham. Actually, and this is going to set me off. Here we go. I know, I know, I know. I know it would. That's why I said it. They also uh, postponed the Europa League match. Why were we forced to play Brentford in the first game of the season with five players out for COVID? Oh, no, no, you have to play the game. Tottenham have the same thing. Of course we'll postpone the game. Don't worry about it, guys. Take a week off. Go fuck yourself. Honestly, infuriating. Infuriating. I'm not saying we would have beaten Brentford. Who knows? We probably would have lost by more with the fucking first 11 out. But... That's the Rory I like to hear. (laughs) For... Where are the rules? What is the standard? We were forced to play that bloody game. And then every headline in the paper for weeks was about how shit Arsenal are. Honestly, it, it, it yes, it's wound me up. My head's getting hot. So there'll be no Tottenham game this weekend because it's Tottenham. And then finally on Sunday at half past seven. Oh, no, wait. Yeah, no, on Sunday at half past four. Sorry, don't know where I got half past seven from. Half past four, we have Crystal Palace taking on Everton. Everton banging form after beating Arsenal. <laughs> Can they put more misery on Arsenal as they beat Patrick Vieira? Probably. Honestly, we have, we are, you know, like a slump buster? You know a slump buster? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're the slump busters of the league, right? Are you a team that can't win a game? Have you not won in years? 
play Arsenal. You'll get an easy win as we just bend over for you. It's ridiculous. But then anyway. we've got also we've got also midweek fixtures both in Serie A and in the Premier League. These uh, like the the race for the title is going to get very very hot in this month of December. <laughs> and another thing that I wanted to say that I always wanted to say but I never did is that whenever we say the times of the games, Rory and I are on a different time zone. I, I say switch. them with the Italian <laughs> time, and Rory does a bit of a back and forth. Sometimes he remembers to detract one hour. Yeah. But it's... guys, you all have a football app <laughs> yeah. and you can check it. And maybe we can stop saying the times and we will just say on Saturday and on Sunday. Yeah, However, maybe. Halfway through, I was like, wait, did I do Central European time last week? I think I did. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> Anyways, I'm sure you guys got the hang of it. If we have nothing else to cover in the respective leagues, not in the Champions League, three seconds to think about it. One, two, three. We're good. Should we jump to the weekly topic? Rory, do you want to announce it? We are going to be talking about the, inspired by Barcelona, of course, the most disastrous Champions League campaigns in Champions League history. Welcome to the weekly topic. This is the first time that I do this little chant. I'm definitely clipping that, by the way. I'm definitely clipping that. Also the last one. (laughs) We have picked, actually... A list of very disappointing group stage performances in the Champions League. But guys, recently we are very aware of the fact that maybe we talk a little too much. And so we decided in the end (laughs) to just pick two very dire performances, each in Champions League history. I've got an English team and a Spanish team. Rory, what have you got? I've got two English teams. So we're all keeping it a bit... Blighty. I think, to be fair, we could have gone for some Italian teams, but Tommy mentioned or noticed that Juventus were the only team that got through the group stages recently. Well, no, no, no. It's a few to choose from, right? It's actually not true because the Napolis made it to the the other rounds. The Romas did. There was that year the Roma went all the way to Mm, the semifinal. And they did highlight a very bad Juventus highlight in 2013-2014. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that because I think that the Spanish and the English team that I'm going to talk about had it even worse. But Rory, mm-hmm. I will let you start. What is your first pick? We're talking about dire group stage performances in the Champions League. So we are going all the way back to 95-96, the early days of the Premier League, and the champions were or the reigning champions were Blackburn Rovers. So they had won the league in 94-95, beating Manchester United to the title by one point on the last day of the season. This was a team bankrolled by a fan. They had Sutton and Shearer up front. They had Jason Wilcox. They had Tim Sherwood. They had lots of good players. And this was a team that had been kind of, had taken the UK like, by shock and won the league. So here they go. They head into their first Champions League um, campaign and they are drawn in a group where you've got to be feeling pretty confident. They are drawn with Spartak Moscow, Legia Warsaw and Rosenborg from Norway. So obviously this is the Champions League when all of the teams were actually champions. So Spartak Moscow had won the Russian League, Legia Warsaw had won the Polish League and Rosenborg had won the Norwegian League. But despite that, I think people definitely expected um, Blackburn Rovers to do well. But this was the first season where it was three points for a win in the group stage rather than two. Um, And 11 of the teams in the tournament that year made their debut. So there was um, Blackburn Rovers, Dortmund, Ferenc Varos, Juventus, uh, Legia Warsaw, Real Madrid. This was their kind of debut season in the Champions League. But what state were Blackburn Rovers in? So they'd won the league under Kenny Dalglish, Liverpool legend, but he had just resigned and they had Ray Harford, the assistant manager who had taken charge. And it's fair to say things were not going well. Um, By December, they'd already lost eight games, including a 5-0 defeat to Coventry City. And they definitely carried this form into the Champions League. So they started off with a 1-0 loss to Spartak Moscow at home. Um, A goal from Joran, which was the most route one counter-attack goal I've ever seen. Four players, six touches from a Blackburn corner. They concede 
Nothing else happens. They lose 1-0. <laughs> they, they then continue to lose 2-1 away to Rosenborg in a game where, as you can imagine in Norway, the, the weather was bloody terrible. Um, Mike Newell scored a goal in the 62nd minute. We will hear more about him. But um, the Norwegian team opened the scoring on the 29th minute with some beautiful football, actually. But in the 86th minute, they got the winner with an absolute rocket from outside the area, which was preceded by, again, some of the worst football I've ever seen. Something that really stood out to me was the, the, the state of the pitches. Like, even in the 90s, the pitches were just so much worse. Oh, yeah. Big time. Big time. There was uh, Francesco Totti talking about it. One time, uh, a player complained about the condition of the field, and it was just like, dude, you've never played in the 90s. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, after losing the first game at home, the second game away, they then go away to, to Legio Warsaw, where they lose 1 0. Um, the goal is there's an incredible run by Kucharski. I think uh, my Polish pronunciation is all right there. Adam will correct me. Uh, makes an incredible run just absolutely spams it. It goes up in the air, it drops on the ground, and it's tapped in. Actually, a pretty terrible goal. Um, they followed that up with a nil-nil draw at home to Ledger. So still, they've got their first point in the group. They've got their first point. Um, and a little stat that I found, Urs Meyer was the referee. English fans may remember Urs Meyer. He was the referee who disallowed Saul Campbell's goal in the extra time in Euro 2004. When that name, you know, you were talking about that referee you remember in um, the 2006 World Cup, 2002 World Cup. Mm -hmm. This is a referee's name. The second I saw it, I was like, that's that guy. He, <laughs> disallowed, the, <laughs> he disallowed the Saul Campbell goal. So they're four games in, got one point. They've got to go away to Spartak Moscow. And they lose 3-0. Um, Dmitry Elenichev opens the scoring. You might remember him. He played for Roma and I want to say Fiorentina. Um, I do not. I do not, unfortunately. He was a really great player, Lenichev. He opens the score in. 47th minute, Nikiforov um, scores. And Mamadov scores in the 54th minute. But the moment that all Blackburn fans will remember from this game is that David Batty and Graham Lasso, teammates, ended up fighting each other on the pitch. <laughs> so this kind of sums up the mood at Blackburn and how things were going. Now, this is said to have happened because um, Graham Lasso, there was a lot of rumors about his sexuality, which is awful. Um, and he never really fit into football because he was considered a middle-class footballer because, and I quote, he read newspapers. Um, a lot of players did have problems with him. David Batty was probably quite an uncultured player i think it's fair to say um and the fight is actually to be fair to graham he properly sticks up for himself there's some um some haymakers thrown and eventually they're calmed down the game continues and another blackburn player hendry is eventually sent off so they're officially out they've played five games got one point now is the time to get your first win so they beat <laughs> <laughs> they beat rosenberg at home 4-1 and this is the stat that always I remember this because Mike Newell is he was like a lower league manager, kind of fairly workman like um, player, but he scored what was the fastest ever hat trick in Champions League history three goals in nine minutes, and it's a perfect hat trick right foot, head, and left foot as they finally get their first win in the Champions League to win 4 1. And all of it is in vain, they go out. Now, the season doesn't really go much better for them either. Um, eventually, Alan Shearer would still manage to get 37 goals in 47 games before leaving for Newcastle and turning down Manchester United famously. But Chris Sutton only got one goal in 22, as opposed to his 15 the year before. This was definitely the difference. And they eventually finished seventh in the league, which was the lowest finish for reigning champions until Chelsea and then until Leicester. Um, what would happen in the Champions League that year? Well, Tommy, it was the year that Juventus won it where they beat Ajax on penalties. The last time they won it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The last time they won it. But all we're going to talk about is how Blackburn stuffed it up. 
And my my take, I have to say that right, you were very thorough, and I'm not gonna go in so much detail. But in uh, my two picks, there is a message for the fans. The first message is: Is your team doing badly? Can't your team go through a group stage, which seems pretty doable? Don't worry, because there is a chance that in five years only, they will win the league. I'm talking, of course, about Liverpool in the 2014-2015 season. But let's take a step back. Who were the Liverpool at the time? Well, you will remember the 2015-2014 season's Liverpool fans and AC Milan fans because karma bit back Aaron Rodgers' team in the ass with the infamous Christian Bull. What did it mean? I don't recall how many points were did they they needed to score three points, I think, or something in the it last was three points over two games or five points over three games is one well something team. like yeah. that, but it was very doable. They were leading the Premier League and then they completely blew it blew it away. They blew a three nil lead away at Crystal Palace. Crystal Palace came back and after that, Manchester City overtook them in the Premier League and ended up winning the Premier League. Just to pile up some more misery on the Reds, that very summer, Premier League top goal scorer and one of the greatest names to ever play in the league, Luis Suarez, decided that that Cristambul thing was too much and he needed to move on, and so he moved on to Barcelona. Now, that summer, as many of 10 players were brought in with the money that Liverpool made over the Suarez purchase. I remember this transfer window. It was bad. I think Go it was for it. Bad. Do you remember, do you remember think, some of the names? Is this where they signed Andy Carroll? I don't know, but they signed Balotelli. Is that going to work? Yeah, <laughs> I think it was like Andy Carroll, Lazovic. Fab- they, Fabio yeah, Borini. They went mad. Fabio Borini, Mario <laughs> Balotelli. <laughs> Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That was that summer. But then comes the Champions League draw. You're like, shit, we should be able to do this. Except for Real Madrid, the other two teams in the group are Basel and, with all due respect, Ludo Goretz. So you would expect your team to go through. And Liverpool do win the first game 2-1 at home. The 1-0 was scored by Balotelli. However, you can sense that there is a something in the air because they do win the game against Ludo Goretz at the very death of time, thanks to a Steven Gerrard penalty. Now, after the first game, Classic. they've got three points. But then they go away at Basel. They should be able to seal it, right? But no, they don't, and they lose 1-0. They lose 1-0 to Basel, and I think that this was already a little alarm. Like, guys, the next two games are against Real Madrid. What the fuck did we just do? They proceed to play Real Madrid at home, and this time around, they lose 3-0. I have to say that at that point in history, there was no match between that Liverpool team and that Real Madrid team. Mm. So they actually lose also the second leg away at Real Madrid. And don't forget, at this point, after four games, they only have three points because they lose 1-0 to Los Blancos. And then you've got the two games that you just need to win. The first one is against Ludo Goretz. But ladies and gentlemen, they manage to travel all the way to Ludo Goretz and draw again 2-2. At this point, after five games, Liverpool have only got four points. But the last one, they're almost had to add with Basel, who are uh, above them by one point. They play at home. They play Basel at home. They just need a win. Whatever win, they will overtake Basel and advance to the round of 16. But this time around, they draw as well. They draw 1-1 against the bang average Swiss team and they finish the group stage with only, um, I want to say, five points. Indeed, Basel ended up going through with seven points and Liverpool went to the Europa League. I'm very sorry for Liverpool fans listening to this because you would probably remember the season, but at the same time, look at where you are now. You're one of the best teams in the Champions League and you might as well win it again. But that year... They were relegated to the Europa League. Do you think they advanced, the Rory, from the round of 32? Yeah, surely they went on to win it, right? No, because they won <laughs> 1-0 against Besiktas at home. They lost 1-0 away in Turkey. 
and they went to overtime and eventually penalties at those stadiums that you barely want to play yet. Imagine taking penalties and the nerves really got our Croatian friend Dejan Lovren who missed the fifth penalty from the penalty spot and that was it for Liverpool's European campaign in the 2014-2015 season. Now, only one win, two draws and three losses finishing below Basel and drawing uh, one game against Ludo Goretz I, and almost drawing the other one, I think it makes it for Liverpool to be in this in this uh, very particular ranking that we're doing. Rory? I yeah, think that's me. absolutely fair. I forgot about that campaign. I absolutely forgot about that campaign. But when I made the shortlist, it was on there. And I was like, oh, that was <laughs> terrible. Um, but the, my next choice, I think we're just going at teams that we just want to remind them that it's not always bloody good. But the next one is Manchester United 0506. Now, Ooh. This this summer, they had bought in. They had a massive summer. And this is a summer that you could see. It didn't hit immediately, but it definitely paid off eventually. They brought in Edwin van der Sar, Park Ji Sung, Nemanja Vidic, and Patrice Evra. Now, these players would obviously go on to achieve so much for the club. But this first year wasn't the greatest. They had sold Phil Neville. Roy Keane had been released after falling out with um, Alex Ferguson and then going to Celtic. And Gary Neville was now the club captain. This season, Gerard Piquet even played for for United. I always forget he played for United. But after finishing third in the league the season before, they did have to qualify. They played against Debrecen, winning 3-0 in both legs, which got them into the group stage. Now, they get the group, and you're looking, you're going, okay. They were drawn with Villarreal, Benfica, and Lille. Now, again, you're going to be thinking, Man United, no matter what state they're in, they should be getting through this group. Well, it all starts with a nil-nil draw away in Villarreal, where Wayne Rooney was sent off for, ironically, applauding the referee. At that point, Man United were unable to win the game and get off to a pretty bad start. They then follow it up with a win at home against Benfica. Griggs, Griggs, Giggs scores a free kick. Then Simao equalizes. I've not heard that name in years, Simao. He, he equalizes from the free kick. But six minutes before the final whistle, Ruud van Nistelrooy, of course, pokes home a gig's corner. And they've got a win. You're thinking, OK, United are in control here, unbeaten in the league. What can go wrong? Well, they go. They then follow it up with a nil-nil draw at home to Lille. And again, they receive a red card. Skulls is sent off for two offences. The second one is an absolutely horrific tackle, which Skulls was kind of known for. After that, United can barely muster a threat. Giggs did hit the post. Lille are just happy to get out of there with a point. So now, still unbeaten in the group. Five points. Okay, not bad. You've just got to go away to Lille. And they lose 1-0. Former Spurs player, Achimovic, um, gets the goal. Just before this, United had been beaten 3-0 in the league by Middlesbrough, so they were not in good form. In this game, Ronaldo hit the par- hit the bar and Park Ji-sung hit Mr. Sitter, which meant that Lille got away with all three points. So there's two games left. They've got Villarreal at home, and they get another 0-0. So many games here where they just, re- just could not get a goal. Drew 0-0 with Villarreal. Rooney came close in the second minute but nothing else much really happened. This meant that they needed to beat Benfica away or draw if Villarreal beat Lille. So they went away to Benfica and they lost 2-1. Skulls, they got off to a really bright start, scoring in the sixth minute. And you say, okay, United are on the way. I remember this game. I remember kind of watching it. Um, Skulls scored in the sixth minute, but Giovanni equalized with a diving header. And Beto... Ooh. That's Find another in- vintage name, Giovanni. Giovanni, right? Some of the names I was reading today, I was like, oh, God. not." I've, I've been in a big YouTube hole today, guys. Um, Beto then scored from 20 yards out, and it meant that United failed to qualify for the first time in 11 years. 
really, really terrible for United. This season, they would go on to finish second behind that Mourinho's Chelsea team with the 93 points that conceded something daft like 15 goals all season. But they would win the League Cup, beating Wigan 4-0 in the final, Rooney scoring twice, Saha and Ronaldo. Honestly, I was reading the United squad and I was like, this is a good squad. It's just that they were getting to the... It, it it was the point before they then went on to win like leagues and Champions Leagues, right? It was just that slight bit before. Their top scorer of the season would be, of course, Ruud van Nistelrooy scoring 24 goals. The following season, they would win the league, um, lose the FA Cup final to Arsenal on penalties and reach the semi-finals of the Champions League, losing to Milan 6-2, which I completely forgot about. But you could see this was a Manchester United team that was on the way to doing things. But I just wanted to remind them of that particularly terrible group stage. And since we said that Barcelona prompted this weekly topic for us, I'm going to end our little review of the most dire performances in the group stage with a story with a big, big silver lining. But Roy, just before starting, I want to tell you one thing. Barcelona really should starting should be starting to worry about being in the Champions League next season. And it might as well be easier to try and win the Europa League than to come back yeah. in the La Liga because they're currently seventh uh, with one game in hand, but they would still be seventh even if they won that. And it's looking like a long season for them. But let's talk about... See- Wait, Barcelona and Arsenal are finally on the same level. We're both in seventh. I knew we'd be as good as them one day. I knew we'd be as good as them. But you know that if you draw them in any competition next year, you know how it would end, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. (laughs) But so let's talk about actually silver linings. We stay in Spain. And man, I did not remember about this. Atletico Madrid in the 2017-2018 season a draw fast. They ended up winning one game, drawing as many as four, and oh. losing one. Now, they finished with seven points. That in the Champions League, we've seen it with the groups this year, seven points is a decent tally. And it was a pretty difficult group, but you will see why I found it extremely, extremely disappointing. Now, the previous year, Atletico Madrid advanced all the way to the semi-final against Real Madrid. But spoiler alert, Real Madrid whooped their ass 4-2 on aggregate and they had to go back home with their head down. The next year, they draw an interesting group, I would say, where the team, the best team, is by far Chelsea, followed by Roma. Now, this Roma team would end up going all the way to the semi-finals. I mentioned it before. And the third team is Carabag. Now, why did this group strike me? Because Atletico Madrid had pretty much the same year as as the the same team as the previous year, but they didn't even manage to go through the group stage. Now, the first game at Roma, they draw nil-nil, which in Simeone's you know philosophy, maybe going away at Roma and drawing nil-nil could even be something good. However, I mean, last year you advanced all the way to the semifinals. Then they lose to Chelsea at home, and things get dire. They are actually drawing the game. They go up 1-0 thanks to a Griezmann goal. Morata equalizes, and the Chelsea's Dico, Divo Corrigi, also known as Michi Bacuai, scores at the 93rd minute. Then they have one of those very Europa League-like away games, and they have to fly all the way to Karabag with a Q. And they travel all those miles to only draw the game with another nil-nil. Now, they host the Karabag at home. And what did they do? They draw 1-1. And it's just <laughs> like, boys, what the fuck is going on? And the Roma, the, which would be at that point, you think, like, it's going to be between us and Roma. Not really. It's between them and Chelsea because Roma are winning games and they're top of the table. At that point... They win against Roma, finally, 2-1 at home, and it's their first win of the group stage. However, unfortunately, they take the lead away from home at Stamford Bridge, but they they equalize for Chelsea because it's a savage own goal. The game ends 1-1. Roma go through as the top seed. Chelsea are second, and Atletico Madrid are relegated to the Europa League. 
Now, why was I talking about silver linings? Because this time around, they went to the Europa League with a fucking mission. And you don't see that as often as you would think it happens. They just go in, round of 32, they just bang Copenhagen 5-2. They move on to Lokomotiv Moscow. Wasn't five enough, they win 8-1 on aggregate. Then they take on the sporting. Rory has got already a hand over his face because he no remembers where happening. this is going. I remember the game. <laughs> they beat the sporting 2-1. And then who do they draw for the semifinals? Rory, do you want to take us through it? Is this when Koscielny got carted off with a cruciate injury? I think it is. They played us and they beat us in the Europa League. And it was Wenger's last European campaign, I think. Do you remember who scored for Arsenal? Um, Actually, the you took the lead. In the first yeah, game. Classic, classic Arsenal. We'll take the lead and then fuck it. Um, I want to say Lacazette, maybe? It's correct. Lacazette, yeah. Griezmann equalized, but then unfortunately you lost the return leg due to a Diego Costa goal. Fucking Man. Diego Costa as well. I... Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. I did. When I saw that, I was like, ooh, Rory, we remember this. Yeah, and I remember it clearly. Man. I watched. had to watch it on Twitter on an illegal feed. It was awful. Oh my God, Rory. <laughs> yeah. We don't do those things at the Anglo Italian pod. Come on. We all I mean, pay sorry, for a officer, subscription, no. right? Yeah. <laughs> But then they ended up, that's why I'm talking about silver linings, they ended up winning the final against Marseille with a very convincing 3-0 win. Right, do you think Barcelona are going to go all the way to the final? Short answer, no. I think they're probably fifth or sixth in the teams of like favourites. I would put Dortmund ahead of them. I would put West Ham ahead of them. I would put quite a few teams ahead of them in terms of like who could actually win it. I think this team is like lost. I think it is just, yeah, it's drifting. It's drifting. When the heat is on, I can't see them pulling a result out of the bag. And Rory, before we jump to our quiz, I don't want to say anything. But the heat is definitely melting the snow over in Bergamo. Our listeners know what's going on. I don't want to say anything more, but it's looking like there are seven and a half minutes left and it's going to be fucking intense. Rory, please be concentrated. We've got to do the quiz and then we can go watch the final minutes of this game. Are you ready? I'm definitely ready. Let's go. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. The feedback from last week's episode has been so good that we thought of redoing the Passaparola quiz. However, we're going to do it with a slight difference since uh, we got feedback that it was a little busy with two people taking turns. This time around, we've got Mr. Rolly Quisquolo, who is going to answer as many as... Um, how many letters are there in the alphabet, Rory? I don't remember. Uh, 26? 24? 26? I don't know. I'm and we're sure. both English teachers. Of course, the <laughs> questions are going to be football-related. Rory, do you want to explain how the game works? So, I think I understand it now. I, I have a time limit of two minutes. The questions go from A to Z of the answers beginning with those letters. I can either pass... Passa parola, where I stop the time and have a bit of a think or a pause, mm -hmm. or I just get it wrong, the clock stops, and we go again, right? Or you get it right, and I keep Or I get it right, or the third option, yes, I get it right. Very good. So we've got a theme sound for this game as well. Let us play it right now. Mr. Rory Criscuolo, a Gaelic name and an Italian last name. Do you want to tell us something to our listeners? Where are you from? Why are you here tonight? Um, I'm not sure why I'm here. Fate has has landed me here. Um, yeah, it, I don't know. Irish name, Italian surname. Yeah, it's uh, the best of both um, parts of Europe, maybe. Let's say that. Wow, that's the worst guest introduction I've ever I seen. I don't know. I was, I was any flailing. Show. I didn't think I'd have to explain my ancestry on the on the pod. I was just playing around. <laughs> yeah. But Mr. Chris Quolo, are you ready to start? We've got a timer of two minutes. The questions are in front of me as I speak. Do you think you've got what it takes? 
Well, with that start, I have to be full of confidence, right? Remember, you don't want to waste any seconds. If you don't know the answer, passa parola. We'll get a little break, and then I'll keep going. Ready okay. to start? Let's do it. Three, two, one. A, Mikitarian is from? Armenia. Correct. B, runner-up in the 1993 Ballon d'Or. Passa parola. Okay, so Mr. Robert Criscuolo has got the A right because indeed Mikitarian is from Armenia. Let's keep going with letter C. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Three, two, one, C. English scored an absolute belter against Norway in 2006. Passa parola. Damn it. Ooh, what happened in 2006, Rory? It was the World Cup. Mm, absolute belter against Norway. Let's keep going with letter D. Barca bought him to replace Neymar. Dembele. Correct. E. Leverkusen, Liverpool, Juventus and Dortmund. Who am I? Pass up on all that. Damn it, I forgot the clubs halfway through you were talking. Ooh, okay, so I repeat the clubs. It's a player who played at Leverkusen, Liverpool, Juventus, and Dortmund. Guys, the impressive thing about this game is that when they played it on Italian television, it was questions about anything. And there were people, absolute nerds, that with 80 seconds, they went from A to Z. There was that record, and I was watching on the telly like, oh, my God. Mr. Rory Criscuolo, you still have 85 seconds. We'll pick it up again from letter... F, Portuguese manager, latest jobs at Shakhtar and Roma. Uh, Francesco. Wrong. Uh, This one is wrong, Mr. Criscuolo. I'm very, very sorry. The name is Paolo Fonseca. Fonseca. Mm. We're going to start again. From letter G, you've got two points and three passes. So far, only one wrong. We start again with letter G. Roma's Felix Athena Gian is from? Ghana. Correct. H, Scottish left back at Bologna. Hickey. Correct. I, they've won the AFCON twice. Ivory Coast. J, Porto, Monaco, Real Madrid, Bayern Munich and Everton. Who am I? James Rodriguez. K, the name of Leicester's stadium. King Power. L, Finnish, won the UCL with Ajax in 1995. Litmanen. M, now in the championship, they lost the 2006 UEFA Cup final to Sevilla. Middlesbrough. N, Japanese, Scudetto winner with Roma. Nakata. O, Spanish attacking midfielder at RB Leipzig. Olmo. P, active defender, president and founder of media group Cosmos Holding. PK. Correct. Q, Serie A top goal scorer in 2019. Quaresma. No! No. (laughs) Quagliarella, damn it! It was Quagliarella, but ladies and gentlemen, what a run we had from G to P. All answers were correct. Mr. Chris Cuolo, you pass the letter Q. You still have 13 seconds. We are going to pick it up again from letter R. Are you ready? Let's do it. The letter is R. Ready, set, go. Norwegian won the 2005 Champions League with Liverpool. Passa parola, damn it. Ooh, passa I waited parola. a long time there. Yeah, you did wait a little bit. Risa, um, damn it. Letter S. Are you ready to go? You only have five seconds. Oh, God. Yeah, this go one on. is a funny one. Get ready. Think right. of funny shit. It's the correct <laughs> one. Ready, with the letter S. Ready, set, go. Loves to chew on his daughter's toenails. Oh, skulls. <laughs> Correct, right on the buzzer. Oh. Mr. Chris Quolo, that was not bad at all. What do you think of your performance? I got off to a really bad start, and then that run genuinely surprised me. As it kept going, I was like, oh, oh, I know this one. I know this one. Oh, my God. So, yeah, I'm quite impressed with that. I, I honestly thought that was going to be embarrassing at the beginning. So that is not bad. I think I've set a decent benchmark for you there, Tommy. 
your final result is a 13. Last week you scored 10, which brings you to a total of 23 points. But should we go to the should we go to analyze the questions that you didn't transfer or you got wrong? Let's do it. Let's do it. Very quickly, letter B, runner-up in the 1993 Ballon d'Or ceremony. Now, the first two, so the winner and the mm -hmm. runner-up, they both start with B. The winner was Italian. No, I have no idea, honestly. I have no what? idea. Baggio, of course. Baggio, oh, for God's sake. And yeah. the second one, Arsenal legend, Rory Dennis. Bookham, really? <laughs> oh, yeah, shit. that was him. Oh, that was him. Letter C, English. He scored an absolute belter against Norway at the 2006 World Cup. Was it Joe Cole? It's Cole. Joe Cole, It was against of Sweden. <laughs> it, was... No, it was against Norway. It was okay. against Norway. I promise. It was against right. Norway. Oh, my God. Check right now as I'm talking. Um, letter E, Leverkusen, Liverpool, Juventus, and Dortmund. Who am I? This one completely forgot me. A herpia? I don't know. What? Turkish name, but he's German. Emre Can. Ah, oh, damn it. Yeah, okay. The Portuguese manager at Shakhtar and Roma, of course, was Paulo Fonseca. Then Rory went on a mad run from letter G to letter P. And then you slipped when you said that the top score, goal scorer in Serie A in 2019 was Quaresma when it was Fabio Quagliarella. That was a course. complete panic. Just any player that begins with Q. <laughs> like... I was very impressed by the run, by the way. And then finally, with the R, you said it yourself. Norwegian won the 2005 Champions League with Liverpool. We're talking about... Sorry? <laughs> I completely <laughs> Oh, Risa, John, Risa. John Arne Rise. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest is getting distracted. He wants to go home to his wife and kids. Isn't that right? Uh, something like that. Something like that. Usually yeah, at yeah. the end of the game, there is something that they ask, like, do you want to say hello to anybody from home? Um, I just want to say um, hi to all the guys at work, and I'll see you in the office on Monday. That's what they usually say, right? Well, thank you for participating in our game, Mr. Rory. I've had Pistolo. a great day. I've had a really great day. <laughs> yeah, now shut up. Turn off the <laughs> microphone, please. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, it's also the end of our uh, new episode. Rory, do you want to say something to our listeners? Yeah, of course. Just to, don't forget to come and check us out on Monday, live on Twitch and YouTube for our Monday night Euro review show. We'll be talking all things Premier League Serie A. So hopefully see you there, guys. Follow us on Instagram at Anglo Italian Pod, on Twitter at Italian Anglo Pod, and give a cheeky follow to our sponsor at Sports Club Maps. You can also check out their website at www.sportsclubmaps.co.uk. And now to send you off our customary quote. This time around, we're flying with our blimp all the way to the Netherlands, where Raphael van der Vaart, a great pundit, definitely one of Rory's favorites, had to say something about Timo Werner. Now the host said, two goals and one assist from Werner. For the second goal, he looked like Van Persie. And Van der Vaart clapped back. If you compare Werner with Van Persie one more time, I will walk away now. There you go. Talk to you on Monday. Talk to you later, guys. <laughs>